Hi everyone. Just move this over here. So thank you very much for inviting me here today guys and uh, I will be kind of covering off the bipolar side of things and as Stephen said getting away from the psychosis just a little bit. Um, so to do that I will be presenting data from a paper which will be included as part of my PhD thesis. So um, this is unpublished as at this stage, but it essentially is a sub-analysis of a, um, a big study which we ran. Um, and looking in this particular study, we're looking at how physical activity may be predicting and influencing um, and the association between the outcomes we had in this clinical trial. So to give a bit of context though, the clinical trial is in, um, how do I switch? No. There we go. Got it. We are all still young. It may have been an adult population that we we're looking at in this study, but we're just changing the markers of what we're of where we are adults. Um, I won't be too frivolous about this, but it is important to keep in context that it is an adult population we were looking at and the um, average age is about 46, ranging from, I think it was 19 to 71 we had as, as participants. So what I wanna go through today is first of all, to tell you a little bit about what bipolar disorder is, and then to tell you about our study, which we call the MitoNAC study. And then a bit about physical activity um, within this study and our results and discussions. <coughs> so to begin, bipolar disorder is essentially characterized by two illness phases. So people who experience bipolar disorder will experience going into a, um, a manic phase where it's kind of characterized by a lot of energy. So they, um, might be not sleeping well, they might have a very elevated mood, um, they might be speaking really quickly, have racing thoughts, and they might find that they're incredibly creative and have fantastic creative outputs, or they might find that they're so impulsive that they spend money they don't have. And then the opposite of that is the depressive phase that people who experience bipolar disorder might go into. And this phase is where they are, it's characterized by low energy, so a low mood and not wanting to get out of bed, not enjoying the things that they usually enjoy. And it's, this depressive phase is the phase that I'm most interested in. And that's partly because it's the most common phase. It has the greatest um, risk associated with it, and that's pr uh, predominantly because it's got a greater risk of um, suicide. There's longer episodes and it is harder to treat. So it's important to say that bipolar disorder, people who are experiencing this have a range of outcomes and some people will be completely, you know, they will take their medications and things will be okay. And sometimes there might be a bit of a shortfall between medications that they're receiving and getting back to that functioning level that they previously had. And so that kind of Getting back to that, that little shortfall there, that's the part which is most interesting to me and that's where I focus my PhD. So part of what, we try to, what we're trying to do at IMPACT is find a, um, find a way of reducing that shortfall and to do that we do need to very briefly look at the um, kind of background of neurobiologicals of what's going on in bipolar disorder. So we have the neurotransmitters which is the little chemical messengers that are running throughout our bodies. And Emily very kindly has covered off neuroinflammation and oxidative stress, so I won't go into that. Um, but essentially, our body's responses to stress. And the, the part which I am mainly wanting to talk about today is mitochondrial dysfunction. So what this is, is um, essentially it's trying to create energy within our cells. So our cells need energy to be able to do all of the processes throughout the body. And um, what we find with people who... who um, experienced bipolar disorder is that there is um, there might be a bit more of a mitochondrial dysfunction compared to those who do not. So um, what we might find is that it's all, so essentially it's all about energy production. So for those in the manic phase, there might be a bit too much energy and those in the depressive phase, a bit too little energy. And so there's that, we're a bit out of whack, a bit not, not the quite balanced there. So we wanna try and find ways which we can bring up that mitochondrial dysfunction, bring up that energy um, generation. 
And so we are trying to look at things which can boost that. And one of those things, interestingly, is physical activity. So the more physical activity that you're expending, the more things that you're doing, it can actually help you to be producing that mitochondria and helping to get those cells functioning as we would like them to. So what um, research shows us is that pe people who are experiencing bipolar disorder are exercising less. They're engaging in less physical activity compared to um, those who do not experience bipolar disorder. And there is a lot less research out there. It's very limited, and so not as big as the meta-analysis that Phil has. But um, there are some research, uh, research showing that when they target exercise specifically and do an exercise program within bipolar disorder, that it is reducing some of those symptoms. But very, very limited at this stage. We're waiting on a few more studies to complete at the moment. Um, so what this kind of is leading us through to is a bit about the study which we ran. Now, the investigators in this study were interested in finding that um, a combination of natural medications that might help to um, boost the mitochondria in bipolar depression. So this study was ran in, um, in Melbourne, Sydney, Geelong, predominantly, and we, um, we, the investigators found this lovely little cocktail of medications which might, um, and nutraceuticals which might enhance that mitochondria. So participants were, who came into the study were randomised to either receive the placebo, N-acetylcysteine or what we call NAC, and that is an amino acid which does a lot of boosting the glutathione which um, Emily was talking about earlier. And uh, they were, or they were randomised to receive the combination therapy, which was all of these mitochondrial agents. Um, so they did take 10 capsules a day, and we are internally grateful for everything that our participants did for us. We had about 181, I think, participants came through the study. And um, so of these med of the um, groups that were in this cocktail, we were predominantly looking at the first four I think first, yeah, first four or so of those um, nutraceuticals, and then the rest kind of came in combination from the um, manufacturers. So a bit about what happened during the study. Participants came on board if they were, if they had bipolar disorder and were currently experiencing a moderate to depressive phase of um, depression. Oh, sorry, a moderate to severe phase of depression. Got there. Um, so it is important to say that we were trying to see if this um, medication could have an effect on the depressive phase in particular. And um, so they came in and saw us once every four weeks and they received the medication up until that 16 weeks. So they, um, and we also had an additional visit four weeks after they stopped seeing them, um, receiving the medication. And that's so that we can see, it's what we call a washout period, and it's what, so we can see what happens after they've stopped um, receiving the medication, see if there's any changes or if there's a sustained response. So at each visit, we went through a lot more outcomes than this, but these are the ones which I'll talk about today. So we predominantly looked at their depression symptoms. So they uh, would sit down with a research assistant and we'd go through a bit of their symptoms. We used the scale such as the Montgomery Asperger Depression Rating Scale, or Madras. Um, we had the Bipolar Depression Rating Scale. Then we also looked at social and occupational functioning, any impairment in functioning due to their psychopathology, and um, they, they self-reported their quality of life and their um, life enjoyment and satisfaction, I guess you could say. And we also had re the research assistants at each time point measured, gave a score for how they are improving across each of those, um, at each of those visits compared to their baseline. So as a general marker of improvement. And so the overall study the primary outcome was that week 16 mark when they finished um, taking the medication and that unfortunately was not significant. So we tried to see that if that combination of treatment was superior to placebo at that time point, unfortunately it was not. But it was significant at the week 20, so after that four week washout. And what we found was all of these scales except for the quality of life one, 
they were all significant at that week 20 uh, um, that week 20 time point and um, so participants were getting a lot more benefit at the for then on those scales um, I've also included in this particular study the quality of life because I think that's important to look at when you're looking at exercise so other things that participants did whilst they were within the study is they reported their physical activity. Now this they um, told us at only one po time point, it was at the week four visit, so close enough to the baseline, but um, we had a lot of measures in the baseline, so we tried to separate a bit of that burden out so we could keep participants coming back. Um, so they filled in the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, which is a self-report where they tell us over the past seven days how much physical activity they've been engaging in on average. So we're looking at low, moderate and vigorous activity. So this is kind of going from walking to jogging to running. Um, and uh, so then we converted that into a continuous score. Um, in terms of their en energy expenditure for each of those kind of levels. And we also categorised it as a, for each participant as engaging in low, moderate or high physical activity. So it is, again, important to note we weren't changing their physical activity at all. We were just asking prior to being on the study, what, what were they doing? How active were they as a marker of, I guess, what was going on in their lives? And so... We wanted to take this one little tiny step further and we wanted to be able to directly compare what was happening to the WHO guidelines and WHO recommendations for physical activity. So this is the World Health Organization. So we broke it down into further, four further categories, starting with no activity. So these are people who, if you, when you're filling in the um, physical activity questionnaire, you have to have engaged in at least 10 minute chunks of exercise. So Getting up, walking over to the kettle and getting a cup of tea, unfortunately, won't count. Um, so they went into the no activity for those people who didn't do that. Um, there is the below recommendation. So if your kettle is about 10 minutes away, you, you can come in under that if you're walking over there. But then there's the minimum levels, which who recommends for um, exercise for your general health. And this is, they recommend, they recommend 150 minutes of, yes, moderate, of at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week or a combination of them. And then if you want to um, get additional benefits from your exercise, they recommend 300 minutes of moderate exercise and 150 minutes of vigorous exercise per week. And again, or a combination of those two. So we took the scores that um, the participants gave us from the questionnaire and we tried to give everyone a score of if they fit into any of these, um, where they fit in these categories, just so we could say, compare directly to guidelines. So what we were looking at in this study is their physical activity at week four, if that predicted their response to the outcomes later in the study, dependent on if what medication they were assigned to receive. And what we found was that physical activity, unfortunately, did not significantly predict mattress outcomes at all. So that was the first depression rating, which was our primary rating in the study. But we kept, we kept going, we kept looking. And um, participants who engaged in higher levels of physical activity and were receiving the combination therapy, so that big list of um, potentially energy enhancing medications and nutraceuticals, they demonstrated a greater improvement in their bipolar depression at, um, at week 20 compared to placebo. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, so for this scale, we, um, it's a scale essentially from zero to 60, and we want people to be coming towards zero is no depression at all. So everyone in the study was getting better to a degree, and that's great. So that's why all of those bars are going below. And um, what we can see here, this is just a split just so we can see what's going on. But yeah. uh, participants who were in the high category and receiving, so this is placebo is in black, NAC is in the purple, and the beautiful little teal color is the combination um, treatment. People who were exercising more at the beginning of the study and receiving the CT were showing a far larger 
um, change in their, in their depression scores compared to placebo. But to put that in, I guess, nicer terminology, for every 10% increase in their activity, um, in their reported activity, their BDRS scores decrease by 0.0. 0.09, yeah, got there. So this is a zero to 60 scale. So 0.09 is not a, it's not, it's not a huge <laughs> change. It's possibly not clinically significant, but we were, kind, we were looking further into this. So again, I said we had categories as well. And what we had in the categories was a little bit of a switch. So the one which was st uh, statistically significant here was that the NAC showed as less improvement uh, for those who are in the high activity uh, their NAC people showed less improvement in their BDRS compared to placebo and what we think it's really hard to say because this is a small study but speculating far further than what the data can we think it might be an interaction with the inflammation the anti-inflammatory response of the NAC um, so what that means is for, two, for every one level increase, like from going from low to moderate or moderate to high, uh, participants who received NAC had their BDRS scores increased by 2.85 units. But we have the WHO recommendations to go still. So <laughs> when we compared it to the WHO recommendations, and this is my favourite result. Um, <laughs> So what we found is, again, if they're exceeding recommendations and if they're receiving the CT, there was a really nice, robust three-way interaction here and that um, where they were improving much more than the placebo. And so what that, in other friendlier terms again, is that for every one level increase, so say going from within to exceeding recommendations, and they were receiving the CT, then their um, BDRS decreased by 2.15 units, which is uh, getting a bit more clinically significant with the scale. So what, what we think is going on here is that we've got a group of medications, which meant, a group of nutraceuticals, which are potentially mitochondrial enhancing. And we've got physical activity, which is potentially mitochondrial enhancing. And they're coming together and really helping that, um, and really helping improve those um, those symptoms that people with bipolar disorder are experiencing. So as um, Michael likes to say, it might be a mito-squared action. I'll leave that with you. <laughs> um, there is one more marker that we did look at, which is in terms of if they, um, what we call a non-specified predictor. So this is looking at, regardless of what treatment arm they were in, we wanted to know people who are um, more physically active, how are they going at the end of the study? And we found really nice consistent results where people who were engaging in more activity across all of those different versions of the scale, they were showing a greater improvement in their social and occupational functioning, their impairment in functioning and their um, quality of life. So we really liked this as a way of saying those who are, so we didn't interact on them uh, on their physical activity at all, but those who were um, engaging in that physical activity prior had an association with better functioning outcomes at the end of the, at the week 20 of the study, which is, it's quite cool. We like that, it's good. Um, having said all this, there are a few strengths and limitations I do wanna go over because it's important. So the strengths are that this, is this study could be an indicator of how physical activity might be impacting on um, treatment outcomes, and it's important to, uh, I guess, allow for this when you're trying to assess the efficacy of new outcomes. And it could also inform clinicians to, uh, further <laughs> inform clinicians to try and get um, their patients who are experiencing bipolar disorder, get them active. Um, but it is limited, and all of, these, uh, all of this data should be interpreted very cautiously because it is a sub-analysis of a larger study. So it does mean that it's likely to be underpowered, um, and the primary outcome of the study was not significant. But um, the other thing is it is encouraging and it is um, highlighting that future research directly targeting that physical activity like the research we saw before. Um, is really quite warranted in, uh, especially in bipolar disorder. So in summary, 
Boosting that physical activity when treating bipolar disorder may help to reduce those symptoms. And there also might be an interaction with this combination therapy, which is helping to produce more energy within the body and within the cells. Um, it's preliminary data. It wasn't consistent across all of the scales, so it is to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt, but great for PhD, it's fine. And further research assessing how this mitochondrial generation is happening, how this energy generation is happening, is required. So thank you to everyone for being here today, and especially thank you to all my collaborators and funding sources. Thanks.